Hello folks, Professor Fiore back once again. Today we're going to talk about waves. Wonderful topic. We have lots of cool things we can talk about. Waves are applicable to, you know, electrical circuits, but they're also applicable to things like sound. So this is a nice intro to science of sound. Now when I say wave, most people would immediately think maybe this. But maybe you might also think of, you know, waves at the beach, right? Waves at the ocean, the lake, whatever. That's the kind of waves I really want to talk about. All right. Sound waves. Now, we need to quantify the wave. Fundamentally, a sound wave and a wave in the water at the beach are two different kinds of waves. When we look at the beach, the particle motion, in other words, if we had something floating in the water, right? I got something floating in the water. As the wave comes by, the motion of this is at right angles to it, right? So we would refer to that as an orthogonal uh, or transverse wave, right? So the wave comes in like this, and this guy goes at right angles to it. You know, if you've ever been in a canoe or a, ki a kayak, Powerboat goes by, you know, this is the motion that you get, all right, up and down. You throw a stick in the pond, you throw a rock next to it, what happens if you don't hit it? It bobs up and down, okay? Now, compared to that, we have longitudinal waves. This is what a sound wave is, where the particle uh, motion is in the same direction as the wave. So if the wave's going like this, the particles are actually going like this, right? They're not all going to pile up at the end. That would be really bad, because then if you were in a room and someone was talking, eventually all the air would be at one end of the room and everyone would suffocate. That's not fun. Particles just go like this. Okay, they don't just go like that. Okay, to illustrate, because sometimes people have a hard time with this idea, we have a special guest, and that is the Slinky of Science. The Slinky of Science. How is this going to help? Well, watch. I'm going to take a little board here and a little clamp. I'm going to clamp the slinky of science at one end. And it helps, of course, if you pronounce it like that. Okay. Flip this around. So, the little rings of metal here basically are going to represent, you know, molecules of air. That's a way of looking at it. Of course, it could also be molecules in a bar of steel or something like that, but we're going to stick with air. So I'm going to start the wave motion going with my right hand. And you can see how this compresses in certain areas and expands in others. So that's really the wave, right? There's a pulse, a single pulse. And we just have a source. And it just keeps going like that, right? So literally, if you, look, if you were to look at one ring, it's going like this. It's going back and forth in the same direction as the wave motion, right? Okay, cool. Now, we need to sort of quantify the wave further. I've got to attach some numbers to it so we can, you know, make some sense out of it. So the first thing is, what's the simplest kind of wave we can have? All other waves are going to be built from this basic building block. So... I'm going to grab a little ruler over here. The most basic wave that you can have, the simplest wave you can have, is a sine wave. And mathematically, that's nothing more than the displacement of a simple rotating vector. Okay, let's put that in simpler terms. Imagine, you know, the second hand on a clock, and it's just rotating, okay? What I care about is, if you look at the very tip of that, uh, second hand, what I care about is its vertical displacement. I don't care where it is horizontally, I just care where it is vertically, right? So you can imagine, I'm just going to make a little sort of a horizontal point here, okay? So here, I'm going to start this over here on the horizontal. So here's my little anchor point. I'm just going to use my pen right through that thing right there. So here's that first point, okay? The vertical displacement is zero, right? We're at the starting point. And then, you know, maybe every second as this goes around, I will simply mark its height. Now, I'm not going to do this for every second. I'll just do it in a couple of, you know, discrete points. 
So, you know, maybe at this instant, maybe this is five seconds in, you know, we get a point around here somewhere. So what I care about is this height. I care about that distance. Okay, and then sometime later, you know, it's going to be over here. Okay, so I care about that height. I'm just going to make a list of all these heights. Then it's going to hit the maximum up here. All right. So I can say, okay, you know, uh, three seconds in, it's this high. And eight seconds in, it's this high. And third, you know, 15 seconds in, it's this high. And so on and so forth. Then we come down the other side. Right? And we're going to get you know, new points. I'm not going to go through that whole rigmarole. But you know, we're going to get some new points. And eventually, of course, we're going to be back flat again. And here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Now we get into the second half of that minute. Now we're getting negative values, right? So at some point over here, you know, my displacement is negative. It's below my horizontal reference line. And then three quarters of the turn through, we're actually at the negative maximum. And then this eventually comes back up, right, to its starting point, and the whole thing repeats. So I take all of these measurements, right? There's going to be more and more and more and more as we go around. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot them on time to scale. And again, I'm only concerned with this vertical change, right? It's going positive, negative. And what I would get is something that looks like this. So here's my starting point. There's no vertical. Now, a quarter of the way through, which I'm just going to say is right here, it's going to be at its maximum peak. And then 30 seconds through, it's going to be horizontal again. I wait another 15 seconds. It's going to be at its negative peak. Then finally, it comes back up, right, and we're at zero. And of course, in between are all these other points that we were measuring. You connect the dots, and you get something that looks like that. Okay? So that's my sort of simplified little side wave. Less than ideal drawing, but you get the basic idea. This thing is supposed to be perfectly symmetrical. This half, if you flip it down, should look just like this. And this half, if you flip it over, should look just like this. Right? But that's the sine wave. And all waves are built on this. Okay? So how do I quantify this? Well, there's a couple of characteristics I'm interested in. For example, how tall is this? What is its amplitude? And the units for that will depend on what we're talking about. You know, if we're talking about sound and air, I would care about a pressure value. All right? If we're talking about, you know, an electrical circuit, that could be a voltage or a current. All right? Then I also want to know how long does it take for this thing to repeat itself? Because once it gets back here, right, you know, that vector was going around like this, that second hand, then it just continues for another revolution, and this just gives me the same exact thing all over again. It just keeps going, 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 going. So I want to know how long it takes for this thing to repeat itself. Right, so we've got an amplitude up here. How tall is it? And as we'll see, this will correlate to things like how loud a sound is. The bigger it is this way, the louder it's going to be. All other factors being equal. This we refer to as the period. And we give that the letter T, right, for time. How quickly does it go? Now, in the case of the second, the period, the second hand, that period is one minute, right? It takes one minute for it to go around, okay? But when we talk about things like sound, the period is going to be measured in milliseconds or fractions of a millisecond. It's very fast by comparison to watching a clock. So, instead of having a period T that's a tiny fraction, I don't want to talk about 0 .003 seconds of a period, we take the reciprocal of this and we call that frequency. Frequency F. And that's 1 over the period T. Right? So, if my period was, let's say, one tenth of a second, I would take one over that one tenth, which would give me 10. Right? That would be 10 repeats, 10 cycles in a second. The unit for that is Hertz, named after Heinrich Hertz, abbreviated HZ. Okay? So when we talk about sound, 
hertz, really low frequencies, bass frequencies, you might be talking, you know, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, something like that. And then as we go up through the vocal range and higher, we talk thousands of hertz. So, you know, just to throw some quick numbers out there, um, healthy young humans with good hearing, you can hear down as low as maybe 20 hertz. You can hear up as high as maybe 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz. Okay. That's, you know, that's a pretty good range, 1,000 to 1. That's actually a much farther range than your eyes are capable of. If you look at the, the equivalent of this, a low frequency in light would be red hues and high frequencies would be the blue hues. So from red to blue in your eyes, it's only about a factor of two to one. Whereas here, like I said, you know, we're looking at, at least people with healthy, good hearing, we're looking at a factor of about a thousand to one. So your ears are, are really amazing in that regard, okay? Another thing we care about is the propagation velocity. How quickly is this stuff moving through, in this case, the air? All right. Of course, sound can also travel through, you know, a, a bar of steel or something like that. It can travel through water. The velocity depends on what that material is. But for air, right, the velocity of sound in air is primarily that's what we're going to be interested in is uh, in U.S. customary units is about 1,125 feet per second. In metric, it's about 343 meters per second. Okay. Um, that's relatively quick. You know, you're looking at, if you want to put that in miles per hour, it's like 760 some odd miles per hour. Okay. It's pretty quick. All right. Um, this will vary on temperature. It's not a huge variation, but there is a variation due to temperature. So the numbers I'm giving you are at like, you know, room temperature, you know, um, 20, 25 degrees centigrade, you know, 70, 75, 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. So we'll see that change a little bit. Okay, so you can imagine this thing, because you have to imagine it, you can't actually see it, right? Traveling through, propagating through the air, at this speed. This is amazingly fast if you're a walking human, but it's amazingly pokey compared to light. You know, light moves at about 186,000 miles per second rather than 1,125 feet per second. Okay? It's literally night and day. That's another way of thinking about it. So, you know, when we see um, like a lightning flash and thunder, there's going to be a time differential between those two things because the lightning flash gets to our eyes nearly instantaneously. But, you know, if that flash, if that lightning strike is a mile away, you know, over 5,000 feet away, it's going to take around five seconds for the sound of that lightning strike because that's what thunder is, right? The lightning strike superheats the air and we get this uh, explosive expansion of, of air. That's what the thunder is. It's going to take, you know, five seconds for that thunder to actually get to us. So the, the lightning and the thunder are not simultaneous unless you're like right there. OK, um, you know, if you're in a storm, electrical storm, you're in the house or something, because hopefully you're not outside. You know, if they sound like, you know, it's flash boom, it's really, really close. That's a way you can determine if the storm is coming towards you or away from you. If the time difference is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, between the flashes and the booms, it's coming towards you, right? If they're getting longer and longer and longer, the storm's going away from you. Okay, handy, helpful little hint. Okay, so this is what we're, what we're looking at for our uh, basic building block of sound. All waves, your voice, a musical instrument, a car horn, a dog barking, they're all built up from these sine waves, right? So in air, we're just talking about an air pressure. So how does this link in with, you know, air pressure, uh, you know, the, the weather person talks about, okay? Because, you know, they'll, they'll say during the weather report, right, oh, there's a, uh, there's a high coming in, or there's a low pressure system coming in. So those things are very slowly changing. If we looked at the air pressure over time for weather, okay, it's fairly constant. 
Um, it's about, on average, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, now, in metric, we wouldn't use this unit. We would use pascals. That's approximately 101 kilo pascals, right? So 101,000 pascals. That's typical air pressure. So I'll just put that out here and say, okay, here's my air pressure typically. All right. And this scale is going to be on the order of hours or days. So when they talk about a high pressure system coming in, what they mean is this nominal pressure, and this is at sea level, by the way, that nominal pressure is actually going to increase a little bit. And then as uh, you know, a low pressure system comes in, that's going to drop down a little bit. That's all it is. These changes are really tiny. I am not drawing these things to scale. You know, how big are the changes? Well, you know, a high pressure might be like a really high pressure might be like 105 kilopascals. And a really, really low pressure, like let's say uh, in the eye of a hurricane, you know, that kind of thing. Right? You might be looking at uh, 87, uh, 88, you know, 90 um, kilopascals. So you're only talking about a 10% change. You know, it's really small. Now, what's sound compared to this? Now, remember, this is on the order of hours or, or days, okay, these kinds of things. Sound pressure, the stuff that you hear, is really tiny by comparison. Really, really, really tiny. There's no way I can even hope to draw it to scale because even, in a, even an excruciatingly loud sound, the size of that sine wave that's riding on top of this is way smaller than the thickness of this line. So I can't draw it to scale. How small? Well, threshold of hearing, right? So if you're in like a perfectly quiet room or you've got headphones on, What's the smallest sound pressure you can hear? Well, that's taken, I mean, that will vary a little bit from human to human, but it's taken to be approximately 20 micropascals, right? Millionths of a pascal. Over here, we're talking about thousands kilo pascals. One pascal, if you had a sound pressure that was one pascal, Okay, so still 100,000 times smaller than air pressure, standard air pressure. This is really loud. This is like 94 dB SPL, right? So we're talking, you know, really cranking uh, stereo or, you know, uh, going to a, a concert, not right in front of the concert, that might be a little bit louder, but still, you know, so loud that you really should have hearing protection. One Pascal, okay? Threshold of hearing, 20 micropascals, average somewhere around 100 kilopascals. Huge, huge difference. But in fact, if we could zoom in on this, right, if we could take a magnifying glass and just zoom in on this, what you're hearing right now, my voice, right, if we zoom in, what you would see is a wave in here. You would see this thing bopping up and down, okay? And that would represent, you know, maybe a little piece of a word, okay, this waveform. And with this wacky looking waveform, and it might have all kinds of crazy squiggles on it, ultimately, as we shall see, can be made up of sine waves, different frequencies, different amplitudes, time relationships between them. We can create any wave we want by just summing up a whole bunch of sine waves. Okay, so... That sort of encapsulates the very beginning of our idea on waves. Where we want to go from here is really drill down into human hearing. What's the range of frequencies and amplitudes? What is loudness? What is pitch? And I'll just say in general, pitch correlates to frequency. They're not identical, but they're very, very closely related. And loudness is very closely related to the amplitude of the waveform, right? What's that pressure variation? The correlation there is not quite as tight, 
as it is with pitch, but you know, it does exist, right? So it's a simple way of thinking about thinking about it. The amplitude is the loudness, and the frequency is correlated to the pitch. All right, so a higher frequency is a higher pitch. A smaller frequency is a lower pitch. One final thing I do want to throw out here is when we when we look at plots, right, for like different frequencies, some terms I need to to uh, define. You will hear the term octave. Okay. Octave is a borrowed term from music. It's a term we use a lot, and it just means a factor of two. This always confuses people because, you know, they see the oct, an octave, and they think it's a factor of eight. It's a borrowed term from music. The oct part of it is the eight notes that would be in a standard Western musical scale, like a major scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. That's, the, that's where the eight comes from. But it's a factor of two in frequency. So we use that a lot. Another one we use is a decade. All right, the dec. This one actually works. That's a factor of 10. So we talk about decades and frequency. So the human hearing range is, like I said, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. That's 1,000 to 1. Or three decades, three factors of 10. Okay? The visual range is equivalent to an octave. It's only about a 2 to 1 range. Okay? All right. This is a good, a good place for you to sort of review, uh, get some things straight in your brain, and then we'll pick it up next time talking specifically about human hearing. See you then.